Thank you. We just uh, got to go through the, the Christmas season. And, the, you know, the question that I was thinking about is, why did Jesus come as a baby, as a, as a human? I mean, that's one of the arguments that a lot of other religions have is, you know, that, oh, he, he can't be God if he can't, became flesh. But there's a, you know, there's a, a concept in the Bible that, you know, God, I think, is trying to teach us from. You know, the Old Testament, you know, a lot of times we read the Old Testament and a lot of people don't see any value in the Old Testament. They think, well, that was for a different people. So let me ask you, how much of the Old Testament applies to us? All of it, right? Now, not all of it, I mean, is written to us per se. There's a lot of things, you know, like the temple worship. It, you know, for us, it was, it was a picture of what Christ was going to accomplish for us. So there was, you know, like we've talked about the near and the far. The near, yes, they, they had the temple. And, and, it, and it's sad, but, you know, they're, they're wanting to return to temple worship, you know, where the sacrifice of bulls and goats for the forgiveness of their sins, they, they think that'll draw them closer to God but yet they don't see the picture that's painted. You know, Isaiah chapter 53 and, and how the, 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 the Messiah came and fulfilled, you know, he took our stripes. You know, he, he took the punishment that we deserved upon himself. You know, so he, he had to come in physical form. You know, and there's another concept in the Bible, and, it's, and I'm, gonna, I'm sorry if I slay the pronunciation, but in the Old Testament, it was the Galel. Okay, or the, I think some people call it the Goel, but we call it the kinsman redeemer. You know, and there's a concept that was presented in the, you know, in Exodus. You know, back in, the, in, the, in those days, they didn't have a police force. They didn't have all the things that we have in modern society. So there was the avenger of blood. You know, he was the, uh, the kinsman. The, the next you know, uh, closest relative, they were charged with the, if somebody was murdered, they would track down the murderer and, and basically take them out. You know, they were the avenger of blood. And there was a lot of things that the, the Goel would do. You know, and so there's another aspect of the Goel that, uh, that does apply to us. You know, there would be a lot of people would say, well, that's the Levitical you know, law. You know, we are not under the Levitical law, but there's a picture to me that's painted that's very beautiful that we find in a very small book. If you would, if you'd open up your Bibles to the little book of Ruth. Ruth, and we're going to be looking at chapter 3. I apologize. We're not, we, I mean, you could spend, as I'm finding out, the more I look at this little book of Ruth, I, I, I find there is so much here. There are some people that say, oh yeah, you just take an hour and read all you know, four chapters and you're good. But as you dig in, there's just so much. Now, it starts out with, in the book of Ruth, that Naomi, her husband, you know, they, they, there's a famine in the land. So they, they flee Israel and they go to the land of the Moabites. Okay, and uh, they have two sons who marry two Moabite women. Okay, and basically in this time frame, you know, that, that, uh, the, that her, her husband, so Naomi's husband, and then their, their two sons, they all die. And so for Naomi, her hope in, in, in that time was in her family. It was in her, her, her husband, and if, if her husband would have died, then it was, it, the responsibility f uh, fell to the, the sons. But now they're all dead. So, so Naomi finds herself in a very trying situation. She's in a foreign land. She has no promise. She has no covenant with, with those people. And, and her two daughters, you know, they're, they're, they're basically destitute. I mean, widows and orphans back then had a very hard time. There was no social programs to take care of them. It was the responsibility of the family. But God provided in the land of Israel for the widows and the orphans. You know, it, it talks about it in the law that, you know, the, the, if you had a field, you could only go over it once. And if there was some grain that was left out in the field, then you couldn't go back and pick it back up again. It was for the widows and the orphans and the, and the foreigners. Okay, same thing with the orchards and the olive groves. Every, God made a provision to provide for those people. 
So now Naomi finds herself in this predicament. She says, you know what? I'm going to go back to Israel, to my people. And she encourages her two daughter-in-laws to, to go back to their homes. Go back, you know, go back to your people, go back to your gods, you know, because she's basically, I mean, she's in a very bad spot. But as we find out, Ruth, her one daughter-in-law, loves her very much. And she clings to her and she says, no, I'm going to go with you where you die. That's where I will die. You know, and your God will be my God. She leaves her country, her ways, and, and, and adopts Naomi's ways. Okay, so they make it to Israel, and, and, and Naomi is recognized in chapter 2. Like I said, we, we're going to skip the first two chapters because we, we could spend a lot of time there. But basically, she's like, okay, uh, Ruth, you're going to go out and glean in the fields. Okay, that's, that, that's how we'll provide for ourselves. You know, and, and again, Ruth's in mourning. She would lost her husband, too, and, and they, she had no descendants from him. So they have no hope. And, and, and Naomi had told her, you know, why don't you go back to your own people? Maybe you can find a husband there because I'm too old to, to have another son that you could wed later. You know, there was no hope, no, no, you know, no chance of them ever preserving the line. And that was a big deal back then, you know, with the, the nation of Israel. It was preserving that name, your, your heritage. You know, that, you, you look back at what God did for us in the Garden of Eden. That's why, you know, we, we have the ability to reproduce. We have children. You know, it, it, it's to carry on our, our lineage. You know, and for them it was their hope. You know, to have that claim in Israel. Because their, their, their promises are based upon the land of Israel. Their inheritance. So if they didn't have a male offspring, you know, they didn't have that hope. Well, later on, you know, we find out that there was, uh, uh, you know, a, a family that had just daughters. And so they went to Moses and said, hey, we need an inheritance too. And God made provisions for them. But here, Naomi and, and Ruth, there, there's really nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. So they, they, they've gone out, the, you know, Ruth has gone out into the fields and, and it just so happens. You, you ever figure out that there, nothing just happens in God's ways? He directs things, you know, he causes things to happen. They happen to go to the field of Boaz, who, as we find out, is, is related to the, the husband of Naomi who's passed away. He's a near kinsman. And so now Ruth is seeing some promise. She's like, oh, yeah, I remember what the, the, the law said and, and what this custom of our people. So, you know, that's kind of what the background of the story is. Okay, so we're going to pick it up in chapter 3. We're in chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, I'm talking to Ruth now, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Just in that passage right there, the, the, in the, the NIV it calls it home, but uh, in some versions it says security, in some versions it says rest. And really that's the idea there. Shouldn't I find a place of rest for you? Because right now, for Ruth, she has no rest. You know, if she's going to survive, she's going to have to go out and work and work hard. Because gleaning, you know, you know do you think a farmer is going to leave much behind? Or is he going to hire you know, people that are going to harvest well? So for them to get even a little bit of gleanings, that's a hard day's labor. I thought it was interesting, you know, that, that idea there for, for rest, though. You know, we as God's people, we want to enter into his rest. The little book of Ruth has so many parallels between us, the church, and our Savior. You know, Boaz, you know, he is, you know, you could use him as a type of Christ as far as the picture that's painted there. And we can learn so much from this little book. Because isn't that what we want is to enter into his rest from our strivings? Doesn't it feel like sometimes we're out there just kind of gleaning? You know, you're out there and you're just getting the little bits here and there. And sometimes it's feel like, I just want to be full. You know, I want to be filled up. But, you know. That's kind of the idea here. You know, for Naomi, she wants Ruth. I mean, she loves Ruth. You know, <coughs> excuse me, allergies. You know, Ruth has left her people, and she loves Naomi dearly. So she says, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? 
Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. There's, there's just a couple of verses there that as you dig into them, they, they, I mean, they're just so full of things there. What, you know, for, now Naomi has told Ruth that she needs to do a couple things, and it would make sense. If you're going to go and try and attract somebody, first thing you're going to do is go wash yourself, right? You know, you can always tell when a, a, a young boy or a young girl is in love because they, they tend to, to, to pay attention to their hygiene a little bit more, right? They start using things like deodorant and, and shampoo and, and combing their hair and things like that. Well, you know, Naomi's giving her some advice here because up to this point, she's been wearing widow's clothes. She's been in mourning. She's lost her husband, her hope. But now there's this little glimmer. So Naomi's giving her some advice. Go wash yourselves. You know, put on some perfume. And, and, you know, again, now she's probably on the verge of being destitute. You know, so, you know, to clothe yourself, it would be to take off your, your mourning garments, your widow's garments, and, and put on normal clothes. It's not like she probably had some prom dress in the back corner that she breaks out on special occasions and stuff like that. Okay, but there's a lot of parallels here for us. You know, uh, but the interesting thing here is, is Naomi is telling Ruth, you need to do this. But for us, we find out that we're incapable of doing this for ourselves. Well, let's start out with the idea of washing. Okay, why do we need to be washed? Well, kind of like Naomi, right? Or, I mean, like Ruth. You know, we're, we're covered in, in dirt and you know, our sins. There's a couple passages I'd like to share with you if you keep your finger there. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, let's start out at verse 4. It says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal salvation. Here we're told who, who's providing the, the cleansing. You know, for Ruth, she had to go do it. But here we're cleansed by Jesus and what he has done for us. Because the the... the the examples that we're given in the Bible is our sins are like crimson. It wasn't just a little dirt. It's a stain that, that, that goes in deep. You ever, you know, like spilled grape juice on something? You know, it, you, it, it's not an easy stain to get out, is it? you got to really work at it. Well, try sin. You know, it takes more than just normal water. It takes the Word of God, which is always given as, a, as an example of water in, in the Word of God, okay? It's that water that cleanses us, and it's the Holy Spirit whom, you know, He gives us, you know, it's the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit that goes to work inside of our lives. He's, he's the ultimate bar of soap for us, the cleansing that we need. And the Holy Spirit, again, is always that a picture of that anointing. You know, for, for Ruth, he, she, he, he, or, uh, Naomi told her to basically put on some perfume, something that masks the odors, right? You know, you ever seen somebody that's taken a, like a, a cologne bath or a cologne, you know, a perfume shower? You know, you, they're trying to cover up something, right? Well, well, God, you know, he does that even better. He, he purifies us. And, and that picture of that anointing, he gives us something that smells a lot better than that sin and death that we were covered with. 
Remember when Lazarus was in the grave and, you know, and, and the sisters, you know, they, they basically, you know, they're saying he's been in there for four days, he stinketh. And, you know, we, we were born that way. You know, we, I'm, you know, I'm 56 years old of stinketh. But, you know, he provides the cleansing. So the picture that we have here in Ruth is the picture of, of, of if, you know, we're going to go to our Redeemer, our, our kinsman Redeemer, we have to prepare ourselves. But yet he's the one that prepares us. We have to come to him. Another passage is found in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27 and again, you know, the, the, the picture of the kinsman redeemer and, the, and, and, and Ruth here is, is, is basically of one that's going to be, you know, brought to him in marriage, okay? So here it says in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. See, in the Old Testament or in, in, the, in, the, in the book of Ruth, she had to be the one to prepare herself. In, in the New Testament, the, the, the Savior is the one that prepares us by washing us by his word. He declares us clean. And notice it says, without, uh, without blemish, without stain or wrinkle. You know, uh, you know, Naomi had told her, go put on your best clothes. And again, you know, they, they were in poverty there. You know, so their best clothes, I bet, had a little bit of wrinkle to them. Probably had a little bit of stain to them because they were not new garments. You know, we, we, we take for, for granted the fact that we, you know, we... You know, if we get a little stain on our clothes, we just throw them in the laundry, right? Back then, clothing was valuable, especially good clothing. Remember Jesus, when he was crucified, they, they, they took his garment and they, and they cast lots for it because it was made out of one piece. It was valuable. You know, today, if somebody were to, you know, you know have something like that, we'd look at it and just throw it in the trash, right? It's like, I ain't going to wear that. The guards, you know, they bartered for it. They, they, they gambled for it, trying to get that because it was valuable. So Naomi has told Ruth, you know, you need to prepare yourself, okay, to meet your kinsman redeemer. It continued on. And then he says, and when he lies down, note the place. We're back in Ruth, sorry, chapter 3, verse 4. And it says, when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Now, there's a lot of people that try and make this a, you know, put a twist on it. This, this is some kind of a moral thing or whatever. No, I mean, here he is. <coughs> He's there, you know, they, 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 at the time of, of, of the, the harvest, if they had a pile of grain there, they would lie down with their grain because somebody would come along and steal it. But you know, you know, if you wanted to get somebody's attention, if they're especially if they're sleeping, you know, you would uncover their feet, you know, basically. And and you know, I don't know about you, but your feet get cold, you're going to wake up. She's trying to do this in a way that, that that's honorable. Okay, and there's a lot of commentaries out there of what this could mean. You know, you'd lay down at the feet of the master, and that signifies that you're a servant, and all these things. I don't know. All I know is this is what Naomi told her to do, and she she obeyed. And it, it got the desired results. But notice it says, he will tell you what to do. This isn't something that would be foreign to Boaz or the, anybody in the nation of Israel. And, and so it, the story continues, okay? Verse 7. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pot. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are 
a kinsman redeemer. Again, that, that word there is goel or goel. And, 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 and there's a lot of things that she just said in that little sentence right there. Basically, she's proposing to him as the kinsman redeemer, saying, cover me with your robe. If he, if he were to cover her, basically, that's the wedding ceremony. You know, the kinsman redeemer, there's not a lot of pomp and circumstances associated with this union. You know, we, we know that there's the, the, the like the, 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 the normal Jewish wedding ceremony where they're, they're betrothed, maybe even at birth, you know, they would, it would be an arranged marriage and the courtship would be long and, you know, and then, and then they would come together and they would have the, the ceremonial bread and wine and then the groom would go off and build a, a place on their father's house and come back and that sometimes could take up to a year. For the kinsman redeemer, this is the, this is the ceremony. Basically, cover me with your robe. And if he did, they're married. You know, and I, and I thought about it, you know, here, you know, how, how can this apply to us? Well, again, what is Ruth but a Gentile? She's a Moabite. She's not under the law, yet she has decided to serve the, the God of Naomi, the, the God of Israel coming into their ways but yet you know here you know this is how this ceremony is going to take place basically cover me with your robe how is the church brought into this relationship with our kinsman redeemer but by him covering us in his robe it's not a long drawn out ceremony it's not a betrothal that happened at birth and then, you know, all these different things, you know, and we see, we have examples of the Jewish wedding ceremonies in the New Testament and they're quite elaborate, you know, and, and there's a lot of requirements built into them. But we're just kind of like Ruth, aren't we? We've come to our kinsman redeemer and we've asked him to cover us with his robe. Verse 10 says, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you have showed earlier. Well, he'd showed earlier the kindness that or she had to, to Naomi. She had left her family and she had taken care of Naomi, been there for her. And, and Boaz had recognized that. As we found out in chapter 2, if you, if, I would recommend you read it. Just a very short little little book here. But he'd seen how Naomi and Ruth had interacted and how Ruth was taking care of her, and he noted that. This isn't the first time that he, he's seen Ruth. But something that was pointed out as I was reading the, this story is that he was a respectful man. You know, he may have had his eye on her, but she was in mourning, so he did nothing to approach her and respected her time of mourning. It's only when she presented herself and asked her, or asked him, excuse me, to, to redeem her, did that, that he finally responded. And now he says, and now you've, you've done a very kind thing, he says here. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor, you know. She, she could have tried that, but, you know, he is the, a kinsman. You know, but it was up to her. She could have said, no, I'm not going to do that. But for her, this is her chance at finding redemption from her way of life, the, the, the condition that she finds herself in. I think it's interesting as that's applicable to us too. We've found ourselves in a very bad situation. You know, we, we are guilty. You know, we're, we're, we're under the penalty of sin and death. You know, we're, we're slaves to sin. You know, we need somebody to redeem us. So you go back and <coughs> study the, the whole, the, under the law, how, how the, the, the kinsman redeemer could reclaim the land. He could reclaim the, the slaves. You know, he could reclaim the, the, the next of kin. You know, if, if, if a... 
as it was the case here with Ruth. You know, if, if a, a, a husband died and he left no offspring, then it was up to the next in line for a brother to come in and take that, that woman as his wife and produce offspring in the name of that brother to keep their lineage going in the land, to, to maintain their inheritance. The importance of, of the kinsman redeemer is so, I think, understated by the church. And, and to me, that's, that, that points, I mean, precisely to why Jesus had to come 2,000 years ago as a baby in the manger. He had to come as our near kin, as a human, to be able to redeem us. It continues on. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. Now, we have the picture of Boaz, and he's being very noble here. You know, I mean, the entire time that Ruth has been gleaning in the fields, he's saying, stay near. You know, my, my, my people will protect you. And that's the same thing he's saying here, stay near. You know, he's doing it out of, of respect for her, to protect her and to keep her. There was nothing, you know, uh, of ill nature towards her, and nothing immoral here. He's saying, I will keep you, I'll protect you. Stay here until tomorrow. But he says there, he says, but, uh, you know, that, that, let me reread it. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. He is committing to her that he will redeem her, but he's got to follow the law. Isn't that exactly what Christ had to do for us? He followed the law. But to redeem us, he had to fulfill the law's demands, and he did it perfectly. Again, this is exactly what Boaz is doing for her. He's got to go to the one that has the right to, to claim her. And we find that chapter 4, and we won't get into that tonight, but basically he goes to the, to the next of kin and says, Hey, you know, no Naomi's here, and you're the next of kin. You, do you want to redeem the land? And he's like, yeah, I need some more farmland. I'll, I'll redeem it. And he says, oh, by the way, you know, Naomi's with her or with the land, and you, you'll redeem her. And then also Ruth, you know, and, and you'll redeem her as your wife. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. There's a problem. i got to protect my own inheritance, so get, you go ahead and do it, Boaz. You know, Boaz is kind of steering the conversation a little bit there. And again, you know, to me, it's a picture of our, of our Savior, our kinsman. You know, he, 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 he fulfills the law's demands perfectly. He knows exactly what to do and exactly what to say on our behalf. But again, now, so let's get back to the story in verse 14. So it says, she lay at his feet until morning but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. Well, let's continue. Well, there's a lot of people that will argue back and forth of what this six measures of barley was and how much, what it meant. Some say it was up to 50 pounds or 70 pounds of barley, which I think that would have been a little much for her to carry back to town. So I think this was a smaller measure, but it was enough to signal something. And this, this message wasn't for Ruth, but it was for Naomi. You know, to basically say that God is going to fulfill his promises. You know, six days that God worked and then he rested. Well, that's exactly what, what Boaz is, is telling Naomi. You're about to enter into that rest because I am going to redeem you guys. I'm going to redeem the land and I'm going to take Ruth as my wife. So it's a message for, for Naomi to, to, do, to just hold on, but I'm going to do exactly what I told you I'm going to do. 
by this promise. And it continues on. It says, when Ruth came back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked her, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Again, that was so that she would know what was going to happen. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Boaz had a purpose now. He was going to go out and settle this, and it's not maybe someday, you know, I'll get, to, I'll get around to it. He, I mean, he, he jumps right into chapter 4, and he goes and finds the next of kin, and he says, we're going to settle this right now. For his desire is for Ruth. To, to, to redeem her back and the, the land back and, and Naomi and give them purpose and give them, give them that rest that they were seeking. Well, that's the same thing that God does for us. He allows us to enter into his rest. And it's not through an elaborate process of ceremony or anything. It's all by what he has done for us. He prepares us. And then he offers us to cover us in his robe. We can find that. We'll look at one more passage tonight before we close. It's found in Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. It says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. You know, we have this picture throughout the, 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 the Old Testament and into the New Testament. We've looked at it when we've done the, the, you know, the, the studies on covenant, but basically he exchanged his robes with us and he covers us in his robe, that robe of righteousness. Because the only thing that we had is all of our righteousness was like filthy rags. You find that in Isaiah chapter 64. We had nothing to offer. We're, we're like Ruth. She, she, she brought nothing to the table, did she? Other than the claim of, you know, we have this promise in the Bible or in the law that says, you are a redeemer and I'm asking you to redeem us. Well, you and I, we have to come to that same point in our lives where we, we come to our kinsman redeemer. Again, Jesus, fully human. He was born in the natural way, born by a virgin, so that he didn't have that sin nature that you and I brought into this world with us because of Adam and Eve and what they did. Fully human, met the law's demands just like Boaz. Now he offers to redeem us, but it's up to us to come to him. He's offering, but we have to take up that offer, that offer of redemption. Again, it's not an elaborate ceremony. And that's the thing. There's a lot of people out there that, that want to make it into an elaborate ceremony. You've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to get clean, and you've got to do all these things before you come to Christ. Well, you come to him, and he covers you in that robe of righteousness. He's the one that washes you. He anoints you. You know, So many people think that they have to clean up before they can come. Well, ours is a better story than Ruth's and, and Naomi's. We, we don't have to clean ourselves up. He'll do it for us. But again, he's our kinsman redeemer. That's why it was so important that 2,000 years ago that, that God come in, in human form. You know, Throughout the, you know, the Bible, we have picture after picture of what God is doing for us. And what he wants to do for us. He wants to redeem us. Jesus has paid the price for all of mankind's sins. But we have to come to him and ask him to cover us in his righteousness. It can't be that simple, right? Well, the picture of the kinsman redeemer was that simple. The, the request is made and the request is, is acted upon. And at that moment when he covered her in his robe... He became his, her husband, and she became his wife. So 
To me, there's so, just so many beautiful pictures in, in the Bible about what God has done for us and what he wants to do for us. He's providing for us. You know, we, we brought nothing. You know, I, I, I can, you know, I can relate to Ruth. You know, it's, it's like we bring nothing. You know, we're out there gleaning. We're, we're, we're just making it, right? Just scraping by, but God has so much more for us. You know, the, the nation of Israel at that time was in the middle of a famine, but yet there was plenty in the fields of Boaz. And Jesus has offered us, as we find out in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. That's his promise to us. We come to him, and he covers us in that robe of righteousness if we just ask him and believe in what he has done for us. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for giving us these these recounts of the stories of, of history, Lord, of Ruth and of Boaz, Lord. And, and Lord, we, we thank you for the fact that we, we find out that Ruth was a Gentile just like us. And that she was brought in, Lord. And ultimately, she was a part of the heritage of even our Savior. So, Lord, thank you for including us and for offering to us salvation to be covered by our kinsman redeemer, to be redeemed back to you. Lord, help us to be able to share that message, the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. Lord, we, we know that his, your desire, Lord, is that everyone be redeemed back to you because the price has been paid. They just have to come to you and ask. Lord, we love you. And we ask for these blessings in your guidance and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.